I, I also usually start off by giving you a chance to ask about any follow-up questions you have about practice problems or about the lab um, from this week or last week. Um, I'm, you know, it's, I'm okay if we spend some time doing review at the beginning of, of uh, a lecture before we actually get into new material. Um, a lot of times that actually works quite nicely. And just so that everybody is aware, um, this is being recorded as well. Uh, I'm not sure how, I'm gonna have to play around with uh, how we do the recording to make it actually useful. Right now it's just webcam filming me at the board. It doesn't have the slides on here. Um, I'll have to look in if I can see if that, if I can make that work at the same time. Um, but either way, uh, I will post the video once once it's done rendering, downloading, uploading YouTube, re-rendering, all that stuff. I'll post the link on the Canvas shell um, at that um, week one tab or week two once we get to next week. Um, basically, that's where, you, where you'll be able to find a PDF of the slides um, if you wanted to follow along or match it up to your notes, like I mentioned before. Uh, and that's where I'll post the links to, to the YouTube videos as well. All right. So first off, any any questions about practice problems from um, from this week? Any of these look familiar? Like we should work through any of them? We feel pretty good about these. If I think you silence generally means that nobody feels strongly enough about it to to raise a question. I, I hope that everybody is comfortable enough with your classmates and with me to speak up if you do want help. Or uh, if for whatever reason you're not, ask on the quiz this weekend. There's that spot you can ask for me to um, give some more feedback or if you want some clarification on something, um, feel free to, to do that, uh, to ask there. All right, then. So our, our plan for today is we're gonna start talking about chemistry stuff. It's, it's only been like, what, four weeks of sig figs and conversions. Um, it's kind of how every chemistry, every intro chemistry class goes is you have to get the basics down, the math and sort of how we're gonna show our work before we can actually get to stuff that people consider chemistry. Um, so we'll talk about matter and how that works and um, atomic theory, which is, who knows the difference between the scientific theory and a scientific law? This one's worth talking about. It's a conceptual, almost a philosophical question. No? So it actually has nothing to do with how strong the evidence is. Um, that's what most people think because that's the way we, we use the word theory in everyday language, right? Is, oh, it's just a theory. Um, or I'm just guessing, it's a, it's a working theory. Um, in a scientific theory versus a scientific law, a scientific law predicts what will happen. And a scientific theory explains why something happens. So there's a scientific theory to go along with every scientific law. And for the most part, they're just as well supported, at least um, in most areas, they're just as well supported as the scientific law is. So there's the law of gravitation. Newton's law of gravitation is the law that they use for calculating orbital dynamics, predicting how, how orbits work. Um, that has nothing to do with the theory of gravity, which explains why objects that have mass are attracted to other objects that have mass. So they're both simultaneously um, true, supported. They're just because it's a theory doesn't mean it's not well supported. And in this case, we'll talk about the atomic theory, um, which explains kind of how matter behaves. It kind of took three laws, Jay. It's the law more of a theory. Or it, it could, the theory can still be, can still be mathematical, but it has to do with explaining, or it, the calculating, why it happens rather than just if I drop something, it falls at this rate. If I drop something, it falls with this acceleration. That's the law of gravitation. Explaining mathematically, it has to do with um, with bosons, what they're what are referred to bosons. And if you have bosons that have mass, they were are drawn to other things. They they can still predict that. 
mathematically and explain it mathematically, um, but it's going into showing why the law happens. Um, but yeah, sometimes they can be more qualitative and, and sometimes the laws can be qualitative. There's the law of natural selection and it's explained by the theory of evolution. Natural, the law of natural selection just says that the organisms that are best suited to survive in an ecological niche are more, most likely to reproduce and will over time um, dominate the population. That's the law of natural selection. The theory of evolution explains that over time, that leads to changes, visible changes in organisms in that species. You see how they're, they're yeah. both qualitative, they're related, um, but one is just an observation and one is an explanation. Um, so we're gonna talk about three laws for that they knew about that they discovered back in the 1700s that had to do with early chemistry. Um, and then we're going to talk about the atomic theory that came out of those observations. So around the early 1600, 1600s, I want to say, is when chemistry kind of emerged from being alchemy to being chemistry, um, started with a book published by a Scottish author named, what was his, Robert Boyle, I think? called the skeptical chemist. Um, and that was sort of the birth of chemistry, but they didn't really know a whole lot beyond if we mix stuff together, stuff happens. And so the atomic theory in the 1700s by a, by a scientist named Dalton um, was the one that really started chemistry and our idea of how matter works. Um, so we'll talk about what that evidence was and how it'll work. And then we'll talk a little bit about phases, um, by which I mean solid liquid gas. So phases of matter is also related to how these different um, pieces, atoms, molecules, um, react with each other and interact. I'm going to try to refrain from using words that are using concepts that you've grown up with, but that they might not have known um, in the 16, 1700s. So I'm going to try to present it in a way that you kind of are, I'm going to ask you to put out of your head that you know what an atom is. Um, just, just for the sake of, it makes it more cool and more impressive that they were able to reach such a big conclusion from really, really abstract evidence. Uh, and then if we have time, we'll start talking about energy and specific heat and how things change temperature, um, which is kind of a little bit more of a physics topic, but turns out a lot of chemical reactions either release or absorb heat and change the temperature of their surroundings. Um, so we also talk about about energy in terms of um, temperature change in, in chemistry as well as physics. All right. I already asked about this, but does anybody change their mind? Everybody feels pretty good about these, right? Good, then I'm not gonna ask anymore. All right, so atomic theory actually goes back a lot earlier than Robert Boyle in the 1600s. Um, it actually goes back to the ancient Greeks. You go to the ancient Greeks, they weren't really doing science because scientific method hasn't, hadn't been invented um, in the ancient Greek times, um, which is weird to think about that scientific, the scientific method as an invention, as a technology, but it is. Um, it wasn't until uh, a Persian philosopher in, I want to say around like 800 AD, um, formalized it as the scientific method that science as we know it actually started. So back, back with the ancient Greeks, it was more philosophy. That's, they called it natural philosophy, was the study of nature. Um, and that's actually why, why if you get your terminal degree in science, it's a PhD, it's a doctorate of philosophy. Um, that's actually a holdover for because the ancient Greeks founded what we know of it, or as the university system. And so, and they called it philosophy. So the two big philosophers that had to do with atoms and, um, one of which you've probably heard of, who's heard of Aristotle. The other one was a guy named Democritus. And you probably have not heard of Democritus, and I'll tell you why in a few minutes. Um, but they basically started arguing on this question right here. This is, if we take a piece of copper wire and we start dividing it, you can think about just taking kitchen shears and cutting a piece of copper wire. If you keep cutting it in half, and then you cut the half in half, and then you cut the half of the half in half, you get something that gets smaller and smaller and smaller, right? 
And eventually, if you just take this to its logical conclusion, one of two things has to be true. Either you're going to get to a point where you can't divide the copper anymore, or you can keep going until the piece of copper is infinitely small. And like I said, they weren't doing science. They were just arguing. Um, they didn't really have evidence one way or the other. They just felt very strongly one way or the other. And so Democritus came up, basically had the opinion that matter is made of small indiv indivisible particles um, that he called atoms because in ancient Greek, atom means uh, indivisible, I believe. My ancient Greek is rusty. Um, and he's, his most famous quote is, nothing exists but atoms in empty space, everything else is opinion. Aristotle, on the other hand, you fell into the camp of matter can be infinitely small, and all you do to get different types of matters, mix in the four fundamental elements, by which he meant not elements like the periodic table, elements, um, fire, wind, water, and earth. So Aristotle thought that you could make copper if you just mixed the right amount of fire and water and earth and air together in, with the right conditions. Um, but they didn't have a way of testing this. This wasn't a scientific hypothesis that they could actually design an experiment for. They didn't have the technology and they didn't have the framework to understand if I believe something's true about the natural world, I should be able to test it. They just didn't understand that. That wasn't something they would even think about. Um, so what really ended up happening, the reason nobody's heard of Democritus is he died first. They just, they just really hated each other. They went back and forth for years um, bad-mouthing each other. They lived in different cities in ancient Greece, Greece and so Democritus would publish something um, or speak about, about this, and he would talk about how Aristotle didn't know what he was talking about. Um, it was a lot like the political scene in the U.S. It's not a whole lot of facts, just a lot of, like, you know, attacking people. Um, but Democritus died first, and Aristotle, being the, the uh, pupil of Plato and Socrates, um, Aristotle had a lot of sway because he'd made a lot of advances in math and in other areas, and because he was tied to um, Plato and Socrates, who were big names already at that point. Um, and so when Democritus died, Aristotle actually went to his city and had all of his writings burned. Um, so for thousands of years, nobody knew who Democritus was because Aristotle effectively erased him, um, except for there were a few of his uh, copies of his books that survived in libraries in the Middle East and in North Africa. Um, so fast forward to the Renaissance, Age of Enlightenment, and Democritus' writings get rediscovered by these old white dudes who say, oh, this is interesting. Maybe we actually have a way we could test some of these theories now. And so um, Democritus' writings became popular again with the Northern Europeans. Um, as si the scientific method is really taking root and as all of these, um, you know, this same time as Thomas Paine was becoming big, if you know, your U.S. history. Um, so I, it's really a fascinating story about, about how petty people can be. Um, I mean, you must have really, really disliked Democritus. I don't really know what Democritus did other than disagree with him, but apparently that might have been enough. Um, but anyway, so now we fast forward, we're in the age of enlightenment. So really a little post Renaissance, we're in 1500s, to 1600s. And as physics is taking off, the scientific method is taking off. Um, there are these three major scientists, um, Lavoisier, Proust and Dalton, all discovered different laws of chemistry. They didn't call it chemistry, but they discovered these different laws about what happens when a chemical reaction happens. Um, Lavoisier was the one who discovered the law of conservation of mass. If you have a chemical reaction happens, it doesn't matter what the reaction is or how much you start with, you're going to end with the same amount. Which again, almost is more of a physics thing, right? Um, in physics, you usually talk about it in, in different terms, but um, basically it was the idea that you still have to have all the same stuff that you started with, maybe just in a different form. Proust came up with the, the law of definite proportions, which said, okay, not only do you have to end with the same mass that you started with, it's always gonna be in the, for a given chemical reaction, it's always gonna be in the same ratio. So if you start with 
uh, do math in my head real quick. Um, if you apply a voltage to water, this is right around the same time that batteries were starting to become understood. Um, so one of the first reactions they realized they could do is they could apply a voltage battery to water and it would split into oxygen and hydrogen. And the, what, what Proust found out is that if you start with 18 grams of water, it always turns into 16 grams of oxygen. I won't write that, oxygen and two grams hydrogen. And then he said, okay, well, what if I start with 32, 36 grams of water? You start with 36 grams of water, you're gonna get 32 grams of oxygen and four grams of hydrogen. So he figured out that it was the same ratio, no matter how much you started with, you got the same ratio of products to each other. And then Dalton was the one who realized that if you could start from the same material and get different ratios, if you change what the conditions were, they all, always had to be a certain ratio. Um, but Dalton was the one who said, well, there's other ways they can react to make new matter. It still has to follow these other two laws though. And so that's kind of a big one. It's kind of hard to explain why until you realize, or until Dalton put all the pieces together, Dalton's the one who came up with the atomic theory from those three laws. So his atomic theory said, every element is comprised of tiny indestructible particles, particles called atoms. He read Democritus. All atoms of a given element have the same mass and other properties that distinguish them from other elements. Never, in other words, an atom of hydrogen is just like every other atom of hydrogen. An odd atom of oxygen is just like every other atom of oxygen. And then he said, atoms combine in simple whole number ratios to form compounds. That was the big one. And he said, atoms cannot change from one element to another. They can only change how they're bound to other atoms. So he was the one who put together from this, he was the one that put together that, well, that must be because you have the same amount of water, of hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms reacting no matter what. And that's why you always get the same ratio of atoms out the other side. So he was the one who figured out that water is H2O effectively. He did it from pretty bare bones laws, but he was just trying to say, well, all of these laws have to be true. We see them happen over and over and over again. How can I make sense of this? Why would these laws be true? And that's what led to the atomic theory. And see how the atomic theory is also qualitative, kind of like those laws, but it's explaining why the laws occur. Is this version of the atomic theory, perfect? Is there anything, I'm now I'm gonna have, ask you to bring in your modern knowledge. Is there anything about those four that is not true? Anything you've heard, phrases you've heard? All atoms of a given element have the same mass. What's not true about that? Right, we can change the number of neutrons in a nucleus and that makes it one isotope versus another. Um, but it's still considered to be the same element. And we'll talk, we'll explain that in more detail. We'll do atomic structure next week and we'll talk about what, you know, more explicitly what neutrons, protons, and electrons are. Um, but yeah, that's not exactly true. It's a good first start though. On average, they are. If you're getting all of your atoms from Earth, if you're getting all of your atoms from someplace other than Earth, then they might have different isotopic ratios. And so it might change things. Any, any other issues that you can think of? Jay? Um, atoms, the fourth one, like, can change atoms from one form to another. Atoms can change from one form to another. What's that called? Or where does that happen? We can, we call those nuclear reactions because they happen in the nucleus. And that actually goes back to number one as well as tied to that too, right? 
They're not really indisruptible because you who's heard the phrase splitting the atom? It's good timing with Oppenheimer having just come out, right? Nuclear fission reactions are literally a big nucleus that's unstable splitting into smaller nuclei. And consequently, it's a different element afterwards. So one and four are both generally true, unless we're talking about nuclear reactions. Um, and actually post, post Manhattan Project with all the particle accelerators and understanding of how of strong and weak nuclear force now, um, funnily enough, we can actually uh, accomplish the original goal of alchemy now using theoretical physics and chemistry. What was the original goal of alchemy? Make gold out of what? Yeah, something worthless, basically. They thought because lead was also dense like gold, lead was a good place to start. Um, we can actually do that now. We can take lead and we can make it gold. It just costs way more in terms of energy um, than it would cost to just buy the gold. So it's not economically feasible, but we can do that now, which is kind of cool. Um, but they didn't know that at this point. And so this is also comes back to another part of the scientific method, right? Just because you have a theory that fits most applications or is usually true, or it's true to the best of your knowledge now, doesn't mean it won't change in the future. Um, and that goes, you know, it's science kind of gets, and scientists as advisors sometimes get vilified um, because people like to be told what's right and then they don't like that to change, right? Nobody likes to be told one thing one year and then next year find out you have to do it a different way, right? But that's actually a feature, not a bug. That's not, that's how science is supposed to work. It gets better over time as we get more and more knowledge about how things work. Um, so Dalton's atomic theory does need some uh, adjustments, um, but it's a good first approximation. And until we start talking about nuclear reactions, um, well, and electrons and subatomic particles next week, um, it's gonna work for now, right? And then we're going to adjust that later. Um, it's it's a common theme that uh, chemistry students and, and professors have to deal with that the stuff I'm going to teach you about atomic structure and chemistry now is good enough for now. You take another year of chemistry, a higher level of chemistry, and we're going to tell you, well, we told you that, but that's not really true because we need to adjust it. And then the year after that, we say, well, last year you learned one adjustment. We're going to actually further adjust it, and you're going to have to learn it again. Um, that's just kind of how chemistry goes because you get more and more zoomed in on things. There's more and more variables and more and more details, fewer generalizations, the higher level you get in science, um, which can be frustrating because you, you're going to work really hard to learn this stuff. You don't want to have to work really hard to unlearn it and relearn it a different way next year, but such is life. All right, so let's talk more about matter, knowing atomic theory and some of the backgrounds. Let's talk about how that changes, how we can think about matter. Um, I used to start with a, with a um, you know, what is chemistry? And then go to the, the, the definition of chemistry from Wikipedia, from a dictionary. Um, does anybody have a definition of chemistry? I think I threw it up on slides maybe on Monday, but if I didn't. I don't expect you to actually remember all the random stuff I threw up on Monday, necessarily. It's the study of matter, which is, you know, everything. Matter, is, by definition, is anything that takes up space and has mass, is gravitationally attracted to other matter. And the theoretical physicists can argue with each other because some theoretical physicists will say that, well, if it has volume by definition, it also has mass. And some theoretical physicists say that that's not true. It's a little Aristotle Democritus sort of disagreement going on. It comes down to what assumptions you're making about the nature of the universe. Um, but that's beyond this class. And I'm not a theoretical physicist. So we're just generally gonna say that it's both of those. If it has volume and takes up mass and has mass, it's matter, and that means everything. We're gonna start from Dalton's atomic theory saying all matter is made of atoms, and all we have is different atoms that we can combine in different ways. 
And that's what everything is made of. Which means we only have, well, only, we have 118 different types of Lego pieces we can use to build everything. Um, you can really think about elements and being combined in different ways, a lot like having a big selection of Lego pieces. Maybe I just think like that because my son's nine and has a lot of Lego pieces, um, which is great for him. Um, bad for my feet, but anyway, um, when we arrange them differently, you can go from a Lego sculpture of the space shuttle to a Lego sculpture of a submarine, right? By taking the same pieces, if you have the right vision and know how to do it, right? Same is true for the periodic table. All we have to do is rearrange the atoms, connect them in a different way, and we get different structures and different properties. Right, so this is basically just explaining what Dalton said. Um, and sometimes it's the same elements combined in a different way can really have a big difference. Um, for instance, water is two hydrogens, one oxygen, right? Um, any, anybody know what H2O2 is? Hydrogen peroxide, which leads to the chemistry dad joke. Um, two chemists walk into a bar. The first one says, I'll have a glass of H2O. And the bartender pours him a glass of water. And the second chemist says, I'll have a glass of H2O2. And he says, I'm not going to pour you that because it's going to, you're going to kill yourself because H2O2 is hydrogen peroxide. It's not even a very good dad joke. There are better chemistry jokes out there, but it's the same elements. And the only thing that's different is the ratio and how they're connected. Cool. What do we do with that? Good to know. I now know you now know more about the universe than you did. Why is that useful? Well, sometimes we want to change them. Sometimes we want to be able to make hydrogen peroxide from water. Or we want to know what happens to hydrogen peroxide if you let it get exposed to sunlight. Ever wonder why hydrogen peroxide is always sold in these opaque bottles? Because if you expose it to sunlight, or any light really, but especially sunlight, it spontaneously breaks down into hydrogen and oxygen gas, which then has a capacity to become very, very explosive if it gets too hot. So they sell it in these bottles so that that doesn't happen. It's useful to know these things so that we don't have, you know, doctor's offices blowing up because they didn't store their hydrogen peroxide safely, right? Nobody wants that. I guess I shouldn't assume how everybody feels about doctors, but I'm gonna go, I think it's safe to say nobody wants doctor's offices blowing up. Let's at least pretend. If you, if you believe otherwise, don't tell me. Um, so how do we explain how that different matter also has different properties if we change the conditions? If we have the same matter, if we have water molecules, how can we explain the fact that ice behaves differently than water, which behaves differently than steam? Well, some of the properties that we think of as, as being related to water actually come from the interactions between water molecules. It's not just the fact that it's water. It's the fact that it's water that has enough energy so the, the pieces can move around. Or it's water that has so, so little energy that it's locked into these really, really rigid, regular shapes that we call crystal lattices. If we change the conditions, we can change properties. And we can understand how that works if we approach it from the point of view of it's still water, but we just changed its physical conditions or its physical state. Right? And so that's what we call a physical property. Um, in any of your other science classes, have you talked about the difference between chemical and physical properties? I'm my grad school work was on quantum mechanics and and really, really small scale and to the point where it was barely chemistry, it was almost applied physics. Um, I don't really like this differentiation. 
because phys chemical properties are physical properties and physical properties are chemical properties if you zoom in far enough or if you approach it from the right point of view. But it's one of those things that shows up in tests and in textbooks. So I'm gonna teach it to you. Um, just know that there is like a gray area in between them. If you frame it the right way, a lot of questions that I ask, is it physical or is it chemical? Um, if I ask that on a test, I don't just want physical versus chemical. I want some explanation as to why. Because then if, if you can justify why you think it's a chemical change and your reasoning is right, I'm not hung up on the fact that you said chemical, not physical. Right? It's all about framing it and understanding the fundamental uh, properties. So they say physical properties are directly related to the identity of a substance. And chemical properties are related to how you can convert it from one substance to another. Well, but a substance's ability to convert from to a different substance is related to its physical properties. So how do you really separate those? You guys see where that's a little bit hard to define? There's some gray area though. Um, in general, when we think of physical properties, we're talking about if something changes, it's still the same molecule at the other end. Physical changes versus chemical changes is easier to define. Because if you have a change, you've got a before and after. If you have a before and after, all you really need to worry about is, do I, did I start with water and do I still have water? If I started with water and I still have water, it was a physical change, like ice melting or water boiling, liquid water boiling to make steam. It's still water before and after. On the other hand, hydrogen peroxide degrading when you expose it to sunlight to make oxygen gas and hydrogen gas, it's no longer hydrogen peroxide, it's hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. That's a chemical change. All right, so physical properties are gonna be things that are related to physical changes. So melting point, boiling point, um, color, what does it look like? Anything along those lines you think of as a physical property and chemical properties are when it's not water anymore. So for instance, copper is another one. We always use water because everybody has experience with water, right? Most people also have some experience with copper. Copper has physical properties that are, it's reddish orange in color. It's shiny, it conducts heat, it conducts electricity. It's a solid at 25 Celsius. It's got a melting point and a boiling point. All of these things are somewhat unique to copper. This specific combination is pretty unique. There's not a whole lot of el other elements or compounds out there that satisfy all of these at the same time beyond copper. Something I was going to say about conducting heat and electricity, but it escapes me. We'll come back to it if I think. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about phases. What What are the three three phases? This one's up there already. Solid, liquid, gas. No, nobody's. This is usually the point where somebody raises their hand and says, "Well, isn't there another one?" Almost always. You guys surprised me today. You feel free. What about plasma? Plasma. Plasma is another phase. And it turns out there's actually others. Has anybody heard of a Bose-Einstein condensate? Also known as a superconductor. It turns out superconductors is a separate phase of solid. Um, so there are other phases. And in fact, there's actually more than one type of solid. Um, you can have... Water, for instance, has, I think it has 11 different crystal structures that are all considered different phases that form under different conditions. So if you get water cold enough and under enough pressure, it doesn't form the same water or the same ice we're familiar with. It forms a different crystal structure that's slightly more dense. And that kind of ice actually would sink in water. Um, so there are others within this. We're gonna talk mostly about the three basic phases. But just to answer a question about plasma, because that's the one everybody's heard of. Let's see, make sure I draw this right. This is, right? 
I always mix up which, which axis is pressure and which axis is temperature. Low pressure, high, nope, that's backwards. So basically every substance has a graph, a chart like this, they call it a phase diagram. Um, and a phase diagram is basically shows the lines where you see a phase transition, where you see it go from water to being ice. Um, and so anything, any pair of conditions, any temperature and pressure conditions um, that fall in this area, yeah, give us a solid. Any temperature and pressure conditions that fall in this area, give us a gas. So what's the one in the middle? Liquid. And it turns out every substance also has what's called a triple point, which is kind of cool. There's actually a temperature and pressure combination for every substance where you can have all three phases simultaneously. And it's stable at that. If you keep it at that temperature and that pressure, it stays as a mixture of all three phases simultaneously. And waters is relatively close to the freezing point of water. And I think it's like 0.6 atmospheres. So it's actually not that far from standard conditions. And we can think of it as, if we think of this as one atmospheric pressure, we don't usually change atmospheric pressure very much on a day-to-day -day basis. There's little fluctuations. But for the most part, our atmospheric pressure is a constant. What we change when we go through phase changes on Earth is change temperature, right? So if you start it, so what is what temperature is that second point I, or third point that I just drew? It's the point where it goes from a solid to a liquid, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, or in better units, zero Celsius. What's this point? 100 Celsius, because what's happening? It's boiling. So you can think, if you think about starting here and at increasing the temperature, we can actually represent phase changes as just moving to different places in this diagram. So 100 Celsius is right here, because that's when you go from a liquid to a gas. What happens if you increase the pressure? What happens? Now we're up here, right? Let's say it was at two. Let's try to make this to scale, I suppose. Yeah, we're already so far off scale. Because this point needs to be way up there if we're trying to do this to scale. So at two atmospheres, water is going to freeze at a little bit lower temperature, and it's going to boil at a higher temperature, significantly higher temperature. This is actually how a pressure cooker works. Did anybody do any cooking with pressure cookers before or Instapots? They cook stuff a lot faster because when you seal it, you allow it to boil at a higher temperature, which means food cooks faster. Usually when we boil stuff, we're limited to only cooking it at 92 Celsius at, at our altitude or 100 Celsius if we're at sea level, right? So increasing the pressure means we dramatically increase the temperature that it boils, which is why pressure cookers also are really dangerous because they get real hot. It's basically frying food in water rather than frying it in grease, which is kind of cool when you think about it. Um, which is why pressure cookers make such good food. So to be, get back to the original question, I've had several digressions here, but that's okay because we're still talking about phases. When you, there's a point called the critical point where this line basically stops. I'll go back to the way I had it a second ago so I can point more easily. There's a point where there stops being a distinction between liquid and salt or liquid and gas. When you get to this point at a high enough temperature and a high enough pressure, it doesn't matter how hot you get it. You can't get it to turn into a gas because there's just not enough space. There's not enough room for the molecules to turn into a gas. Gases, by definition, mean all of your molecules are flying around apart from each other, not interacting at all. If you force them to have enough energy to be a gas, but to be too close to be a gas, you get a plasma means something different in physics. So it's in chemistry, we usually call it a supercritical fluid. It means it's a fluid that's both a gas and, and liquid simultaneously. 
The physics definition of plasma comes as a result of supercritical fluid. And that's when your atoms have so much energy that they're not, they don't actually, they're not able to hold on to their own electrons. So we think about when we get into talking about electrons, that might make more sense. But basically we think about electrons as being around an atom. In a plasma, electrons are free to move however they want. Um, which also leads to, uh, who's familiar with the band, They Might Be Giants? They the theme song for Malcolm in the Middle. They have a bunch of kids' albums out now, but they got famous for a couple novelty hits like Istanbul, not Constantinople in the 80s. No? Very, very smart, guys. They made an album about of science songs for kids, aimed at kids. One of the best songs on there is called The Sun is a... The Sun is a... Let's see. I know the plasma, the correction one. The sun is a mass of incandescent gas, a gigantic nuclear furnace. Um, but he got a bunch of they got a bunch of complaints from physicists because technically the sun's not a gas; it's a plasma. So they actually put out a, a retraction, a um, corrected song called "The Sun is a Miasma of Incandescent Plasma." Um, it's very very fun. Um, I'll probably play that for you at some point, especially when we get to talking about nuclear reactions. But that's why we don't usually talk about plasmas is they don't happen on earth very easily. You can get them to happen. Does anybody know any um, YouTube hacks for, uh, for making plasma at home? Microwaves, microwaves will do the trick. Um, don't do it with a microwave you actually care about because you ruin the microwave too. Um, there's a couple ways you can do it and I'll, I'll leave it to you to, um, to per peruse YouTube. If that's interesting to you, don't do anything unsafe. Um, but there's some cool videos out there of people making plasmas in microwaves with pretty minimal technology. I, I didn't hear that. That's a, I don't, I think that they are, they're making a plasma. Well, it's so technically fluorescent bulbs, um, light bulbs are plasmas as well. Basically, if you apply enough voltage to things, you can force electrons to pass through them, even if normally they'd be a conductor, and that manifests as a plasma. The aurora, aurora borealis is a plasma. It's really, really high energy molecules, and when they react, they produce this sort of glowing um, phase that's more like a plasma temporarily, and then they fall apart. So there are some, some places on Earth where you do see plasmas, but they're not that. And just to go back to our, when we're talking about how these different phases work, um, solids, the way that I can always make sure I get this chart right, if I stop and think about it, is because I know that solids are tightly packed together and there's very little atomic movement. And so solids happen when you've got low temperature and high pressure when you're forcing everything together really, really tightly, then you don't get a whole lot of movement. Um, and they're also defined as having definite volume and definite shape. Meaning if you take a solid out of the container that it's in, it still keeps its same shape. So think about an ice cube, right? Take an ice cube out of an ice cube tray, what shape is it? It's, it's still the cube, right? If you dump water out of an ice cube tray, does it stay as a cube? No, the big difference between solids and liquids, liquids are also tightly packed and they also have a definite volume, but they have an indefinite shape. All of the molecules have enough energy that they're able to move around each other a little bit more, but they're still packed fairly tightly together. And then last but not least, gases, the atoms or molecules are so far apart that they, we, they effectively have no interaction with each other. Um, and so gases have indefinite volume because they'll expand to fill whatever container they're in. And they have indefinite shape because they, exempt, they expand to fill whatever, whatever container they're in. And they have lots of atomic movement or molecular movement. Um, just for context, if you had, if there was a gas molecule in at atmospheric pressure, um, and let's say that 
so that we can visualize this, the gas molecule was the size of a person. On average, gas molecules travel so far that it would be like um, without running into anything else that to scale, it would be like if a um, traveling from here to Jupiter without running into another person. That's about how far gas molecules travel to scale before they run into anything else. So basically gases are almost completely empty. There's the ga atoms are so far apart that there's almost nothing to it. The other analogy I use for this to remember where, which ones are high energy versus low energy. Um, you can always think about boiling water, right? You start with low energy. If it's ice, you add energy to it and it melts to become liquid. So the liquid has to have more energy than the ice did. And then if you keep adding energy, you get steam. Um, I also think about it in terms of concerts. A solid is like going to a show that has assigned seating. Typically, those are lower energy shows. Um, liquids are general admission. Still packed pretty tightly together, but you can move around a little bit. And those tend to be higher energy shows, right? So what's a gas? It's a, yeah, it's a pit. It's a metal show. It's motorhead. Um, lots and lots and lots of energy. Lots of empty space compared to general admission where everybody's packed together really tightly. It's not a perfect analogy, but it works pretty well. So you can think about a phase change. You started with a bunch of motorhead fans in assigned seating, and then you increase the energy of the situation by bringing Motorhead on stage. We're going back into the, the glory days before Lemmy was dead. Um, you bring Motorhead up onto the stage, you've increased the energy of that room. Very quickly, it's not going to be assigned seating anymore, right? Very quickly, you wind up moving to another phase. Um, just, I always kind of like that as an analogy. It's just kind of fun for me. Um, Hopefully it was helpful for you as well. Interestingly enough, the definite volume actually plays a role in being able to um, being able to compress things. Gases can be compressed, liquids cannot. And if you compress a gas enough, you actually force it into a different phase. So in our phase diagram here, it's, that's instead of having a constant pressure and changing the temperature. What if we had a constant pressure, or sorry, constant temperature, and we increase the pressure? We can get a phase change that way too, right? So this is the phase diagram for water. So what does this predict would happen if you started with water with, that's frozen and you applied pressure to it? It melts. Interesting enough, this is how ice skating works. We think of ice as being slippery, but it's not actually that slippery on its own. It's slippery when you compress it and you add a bunch of pressure because you actually create a really thin layer of liquid water on top of the ice. And that's what you actually skate on, which is kind of interesting. Um, if anybody watches the NHL and seen any of those outdoor games, we had the one at Tahoe. Um, at Edgewood a few years ago that was really, really too hot, right? Um, it, we got unsafe for the skaters or for the hockey players to skate because it was so warm. Um, but the opposite can happen too. I want to say it was in Toronto, but it might have been the one in, no, it was the one in Minnesota. Um, they actually it got, the ice got so cold um, that they couldn't skate because their skate blades couldn't add enough pressure. If it was over here instead of over here, you have to add way more pressure to get to that phase change, right? So I got to the point where they couldn't skate anymore. Um, so they actually, if you uh, if you go into uh, an NHL arena, they actually keep coolant lines that also are capable of warming things up underneath the ice in those outdoor rinks so that it doesn't get too cold. My in-laws were at that game. They said it was freezing. They brought cardboard boxes to stand on. Um, so that they didn't have to stand on the concrete at the stadium in their boots. Um, and they only, I think they made it two periods before they had to leave because it was, I want to say puck drop, it was like five below and then it went down from there. Um, that's before wind chill. It was nasty. I wasn't in Minnesota at the 
Um, all right. So we've been talking about energy in sort of general senses, right? What is energy? If I say I had to add energy to the system to get through a phase change, heat is one way to think about it, right? More heat is more energetic. That matches with our phases, right? What was yours? Movement. Yeah, if we get into, if we start zooming into the molecular level, energy has, has a couple different forms. We'll talk about what it looks like macroscopically and then microscopically. Um, but movement, if we think about a bowling ball, if I just have a bowling ball sitting right here and it's not moving, it's not very energetic, right? If I have a bowling ball in the same spot and I roll it really hard, it has more energy, right? So movement, heat, turns out, well, well the fine energy is the, is the ability of an object to do work. And work is another physics term. Um, work means to accelerate something, more or less. And so if you can change the direction that something is moving, or get it to start moving, you've done work to that system. And so energy is literally defined as, can you make stuff move? Which works pretty well um, until we start getting into microscopic zone. So the most common form of movement is called kinetic energy. And that's our bowling ball example. It just means when things are moving, it has kinetic energy, which what's the corresponding, what's the other type? Potential. Potential, right? That's the energy that even my bowling ball that's not moving has potential energy because what could happen? It could fall, especially if I hold it up here. If I hold the bowling ball still right here, it has a lot of potential energy because if I let go, it falls. All right, so, a more general way of thinking about potential energy is energy that is stored. So this is all great when we're talking about bowling balls, but that's a physics class. We need to now figure out how that applies to molecules. Um, water flowing downhill is turning potential energy into kinetic energy. Makes sense, right? It has lots of potential energy when it's at our altitude as it flows down uh, towards Sacramento or Pyramid Lake, it's losing potential energy because its altitude is dropping, but it's being turned into kinetic energy, the movement of the water itself. Um, climbing, rock climbing, be the opposite. Rock climbing is turning potential energy into, or sorry, turning kinetic energy into potential energy. So this is another one where if you define your terms right, it actually gets really fuzzy because where did the kinetic energy come from? You weren't moving when you started, you started moving at some point, but you're standing at the bottom of a rock wall and you start climbing. The climbing is the kinetic energy, but how did the kinetic energy get there? From potential energy somewhere, right? So that's why I almost misspoke when I said climbing is turning potential energy into kinetic energy into potential energy. Um, and just random pictures. At the molecular level, we think of, we measure kinetic energy, not by actually measuring how fast objects are moving, um, but by measuring the temperature. Turns out if you, if you know the temperature of something, you actually know the average kinetic energy of the molecules in that object, which is kind of interesting. Um, we could take a sample of gas at a certain temperature, do some math with it, and we could come up with the average kinetic energy of every gas molecule. Um, so temperature is really just directly measuring that. It's a way we kind of get out of the way instead of needing a stopwatch and looking at how fast something is moving to figure this out, we use a thermometer. Um, what is molecular potential energy? If we, have, if we have molecular kinetic energy as temperature, what is molecular potential energy? 
this is where it really ties to chemistry. Where did all of that energy, that potential energy that you had in your muscles before you started climbing and turned it to kinetic energy, where did that come from? From food. Say it louder. ATP, yeah. Why is ATP a useful molecule for energy? Because of the chemical bonds specifically, the fact that it's got unstable chemical bonds. When those chemical bonds break, the energy is released. So chemical potential energy is literally the energy that's stored in chemical bonds. When you break those bonds and form different bonds, you release that and turn that into higher temperature sometimes. Anytime you can burn something and it heats up the surroundings, just think about a gas burner on your stove. You're taking natural gas, breaking the carbon-carbon bonds, carbon-hydrogen bonds, and you're making carbon-oxygen bonds and hydrogen-oxygen bonds that are more stable. The difference in energy from where you started and where you ended is released to the surroundings as increased temperature, as heat. Right? So all of our changes are going to be related to um, how much energy do we put in or how much energy is released and what does that do to the surroundings, right? So with my bowling ball that has potential energy, I release the potential energy by letting go, right? In your cells, you release the potential energy by breaking a phosphate bond. You break a phosphate off of ATP to make ADP and an, and an inorganic phosphate or by burning molecules or uh, organic molecules is another way just not the way that our bodies use right that's the way a car turns chemical potential energy into kinetic energy or even an electric vehicle it's not burning anything that's another chemical reaction you store the energy in the chemical bonds as as potential energy and you release it gradually to turn it into kinetic energy so Let's talk about temperature. And then we can actually start doing some, we'll do some practice calculations. Temperature is the most annoying unit conversion that exists, if you ask me, um, because it's not a straightforward unit conversion. You can't write it out as just a regular unit conversion. Um, be, for a couple reasons, mostly because there's a linear transform component in there as well, as opposed to just you multiply, it's not directly proportional to anything. Conversions that are directly proportional means that no, if you have zero meters as a distance, that's also zero miles, right? But if you have zero Celsius, that's not zero Fahrenheit, right? So the fact that those don't line up is why we can't just treat it as a conversion. They're not proportional. Who knows the math definition of proportional? Anybody? It's a ratio. I mean, and basically it means that if you plot the things on, a, on an XY graph, it goes through zero. It goes through the origin of the graph. If that's true, then you have a simple ratio and you can use just do a regular conversion. Like, like if we think about our density conversions, we call this mass in this volume, the slope of the line is density, but we can convert from a volume to a mass with just a simple slope, just by looking at the slope. Temperature has an intercept, which means we have to do addition and subtraction as well as multiplying. Um, and it's most annoying because this is going to be the one that you mess up on your sig figs on the test. Almost guaranteed because you have to switch sig fig rules in the middle. Right? What's, what's the rule for multiplying and dividing? How do you know how many sig figs to keep? Keep the same number as you started with, right? Or the least certain number, the fewest number of sig figs in your calculation, right? What's your rule for addition and subtraction? You have to keep the, the same uncertainty as your least certain measurement, which as long as you've got decimal places past the decimal, you just keep the same decimals. 
And here we have both rules because we have multiplying and we have addition, which makes it so you have to switch rules, rounding rules in the middle of your calculation, which is annoying. All right, so. Um, is there a good reason why we have different temperature scales? Does anybody know where Fahrenheit comes from originally? Weather. Weather. We'd like to think that. The story that I was told and that I've, I've looked into it a little bit is actually a lot more annoying than that even. Um, Celsius makes a lot of sense, right? Celsius is great. We all deal with water all the time. Water freezes at zero, it melts at, or it boils at 100. Great, makes sense, perfect unit. Um, Fahrenheit, from what I've heard, um, zero Fahrenheit was the coldest that Lord Fahrenheit could get a mixture of salt and ice and water. He just sat, made a saturated salt solution, added ice to it, and the coldest point he could make it, he called that zero. And 100, um, he made, again, what I've heard is the body temperature of a cow um, because he owned lots of cattle. He was a lord in, in Northern England. Um, and it tells you something that he made body temperature of a cow a hundred and not, you know, like a person. Um, you would think that like the people living on his land might be more important to him than the cows, but apparently not. Um, so anyway, Fahrenheit's dumb, like most imperial units. We're going to avoid using Fahrenheit other than the fact we all think in Fahrenheit. And if you don't, you are very lucky. Um, and actually, if you want to train your brain to think in Celsius, change all the settings on your phone to only be in metric units. Because if you look at your phone for the weather every day, all, all year, and it always gives you your highs and lows in Celsius, you'll start to adjust. At first, you'll have to translate it in your head, but you'll start to adjust and think in Celsius better. Um, but it's, again, really annoying to do that once you've gotten used to doing it in Fahrenheit. All right. Um, so Fahrenheit to Celsius conversion, it's pain. The equation's easy enough. It's a linear transform. You get a, uh, it's 1.8, but more accurately, it's nine fifths times temperature in Celsius plus 32. Nine fifths and 32 are exact, meaning infinite sig figs. It's not about 32, it's 32.000 out to infinity. Same for the nine fifths. Every five degrees change in Celsius is a nine degrees change in Fahrenheit. So if you're approximating in your head, it's a close to double. Um, so if a change in five Celsius is about, is nine Fahrenheit, but easier to do the math in your head if it's, if you just think about it, it's doubled. Um, if you're doing it on paper, exact numbers though. What does that do? Let's say, let's say we measured a temperature, let's see room temperature in here, it's a little warm. Let's call it 22.1 Celsius. I'm over reporting my certainty in that case. Let's, let's call it 22 plus or minus one degree Celsius. I don't think I'm off by more than that. What is that in Fahrenheit? 22 degrees Celsius into degrees Fahrenheit with the right uh, number of sig figs. Well, about 74, but let's plug it in. So not nine fifths times 22. Let's see, that's gonna be what? Sorry, no, what's the 22 times nine fifths before you add? 39.6. How many sig figs do we keep? Just the two, right? Because multiplication. So we had two sig figs here. We need two sig figs there. So it's 40 plus or minus one plus 32. 
and now we get 72 degrees, right? Well, sig figs weren't that hard for that one. Why am I complaining about that? Well, we'll see an, ex see an example in a second. Um, let's go the other way. Let's say your little brother's running a fever. It's 101.1 on the, on the um, thermometer. What is that in Celsius? So we have to do some algebra, right? Plug it in for TF, solve for TC. 101.1 equals 9 fifths TC plus 32. Algebra is not that tricky, right? Subtract 32 from both sides. Except I just said subtract. So how many digits do we keep? 101.1 minus 32, exactly 32. So that's really 32.000 forever. So 101.1 minus 32. I pick numbers that are hard to do in your head, right? Is it 69.9? How many sig figs do I keep? No, point one. It's got to be point one. Yeah. Is it 69.10? Did I just do the math wrong in my head? 101.1 minus 32. Yeah, 69.1. Equals nine fifths temperature in Celsius. How many digits do I keep? It was subtraction, right? So we keep to the same decimal place, the same uncertainty. It was plus or minus a 10th of a degree here. So we keep it plus or minus a 10th of a degree. We lost a sig fig by doing that subtraction. And now when we divide by nine fifths to get our final answer, we get, give, And how many do we keep? Now we did we did division, right? Which is really just multiplication, which means we keep the same number of sig figs, not the uncertainty. So 38.4. So if I pick, if I'm really testing whether or not you're doing this properly and know what you're doing, when I ask you a question like this on the test, I'm going to pick a temperature where you don't end with the same number of sig figs you started with. We went from four sig figs to three sig figs because we had to switch rules in the middle. That's what makes temperature so annoying and makes it so I'm going to ask you a, a conversion problem about temperature specifically to test whether or not you're remembering to switch rules in the middle. Again, annoying, I know. Um, worth paying attention to though so that you don't over represent your accuracy if we kept four sig figs we'd be saying that that despite the fact we we're plus or minus a tenth of a degree fahrenheit we're plus or minus a hundredth of a degree celsius that's not accurate we're still plus or minus we're plus or minus a tenth of a degree celsius now which is close to the same as plus or minus a tenth of a degree fahrenheit Right? That's why we have these rules is to make sure un uncertainty stays relatively close to the same when we do math. In? So if we're rounding to the tenths place, if this was five, we would round it up, right? Is this five? It's less than five, right? It's 499. So 
even though it's 499. And if we were rounding to the hundredths place, we would go to five. This is why we don't round multiple times in the same answer, right? Because you can wind up with your number, your answer drifting if you round every digit. You only look at the digit immediately following the one that you want to keep. Good question, though. All right. Who here has done anything with Kelvin? Ish. Vaguely recalls it. Um, why do we need Kelvin? We have Celsius and Fahrenheit. Why are we introducing another thing in there? It's the science one. It's because that's what scientists do. They make things more complicated and invent their own units sometimes. Yeah, why did we have these pluses in there? Because it wasn't proportional, right? Yeah. So if we plotted, if we plotted temperature in Fahrenheit versus temperature in Celsius, it doesn't go through zero, right? If you plotted, if we looked at how fast molecules were moving, if instead of looking at temperature versus temperature, let's look at temperature in Celsius versus energy, kinetic energy of the molecules. What happens when you get to zero Celsius? They're still moving. It's not zero because you can get, partly because you can get colder than zero Celsius, but also partly because you can still have a liquid at zero Celsius, which means stuff is still moving. If stuff is still moving, you can get colder. And it means that you're going to have a line that looks like this. Where you look at the kinetic energy of the, of the molecules is still a positive number at zero Celsius. So what Kelvin is, is well, Kelvin just says, well, what if we took Celsius and we just shifted where zero was? Still kept the same slope of the line. We're just going to shift what we call zero to be back here. And then just get rid of that. We'll call it temperature in Kelvin. All of a sudden, it's proportional now. Now, all of a sudden, we can do easy math with no addition and subtraction. So Kelvin is the, science, the scientist's temperature unit because it allows us to use a lot of uh, really, really useful equations that if we didn't have it in Kelvin, there's a weird funky plus X term added to it. And addition makes um, our calculations more complicated. So we have Kelvin as well. That actually is an easier conversion because like I said, we didn't change the slope of the line. In other words, your temperature in, or your change in temperature in Kelvin is the same as your change in temperature in, in Celsius. You go up one degree Celsius, it's also one degree Kelvin. All we did was shift the zero. So our equation to go from Celsius to Kelvin, uh, temperature in Kelvin is just your temperature in Celsius plus a constant. It is not exact because zero Celsius is not the perfect way of defining absolute zero. So this is, if you take Celsius, you go to negative 273.15 Celsius, that's this point. That's where it hits zero. That's where all molecular motion stops. Nothing is moving anymore until we include quantum effects. But Forget that for now. At zero Kelvin, everything stops moving. So you can't get colder than zero Kelvin because things can't be moving slower than stopped. Seems obvious, right? That's why absolute zero is absolute zero. You can't get slower than zero. Let's take our, was it 38.4? 
number from before. Erase that one so it's not confusing. What is that in Kelvin? Three hundred and point five. That's our that's our calculator answer, right? Yeah. Where do we round it? That's measured, but so is this. The point six to the tens place. All right. That's a good enough place to stop for today. Um, talk to them about uh, due dates. Yes, real quick, due dates. Um, those conversion problems from this week, from Tuesday, and the, the homework problem from the week before that, that was the, the first word problems, the black hole problem mm -hmm. set. Um, they both have assignments on Canvas that have a due date of Friday um, at midnight tonight, because I would assume that the homework one you've finished and been working on the other ones, I just had to set a due date. I'm not going to be that picky about it. And since you have the quiz to do over the weekend, I didn't want it to be too much. Um, but turn those in when you get a chance. Turn in what you have at least. And then I'll see everybody on Monday. Hey, Gwen, right? Yes. I know your mom. Yes, I know. Um, I won't be here on Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. Okay. Um, Is there anything I should do? Let me, let me stop recording real quick. Uh, and